Today's video is sponsored by Backblaze. Get a 15-day free trial to back up your files at backblaze.com slash side projects. More on them in a bit. Previous on this channel, we looked at ancient inventions that were well ahead of their time. From automatic doors and flushing toilets, the creativity and ingenuity of ancient peoples knew no bounds. Today we're going to be stepping a bit forward in time, past the ancient world, to look at even more inventions that were still well ahead of their time. Anyone who has walked outside with an unzipped jacket on a particularly windy day can tell you the idea of a parachute seems like a pretty simple and intuitive one. Indeed, the first evidence of someone attempting to use a parachute dates back to 852 in Spain, but the attempts were extremely unsuccessful. It wasn't until Leonardo da Vinci, circa 1485, that we have the first sketch of the modern-day parachute. There was at least one other drawing of a similar star parachute from the 1470s, but that design was flawed to the point of meaning certain death, so we'll give da Vinci the credit for this one. The first modern parachute wouldn't be used until 300 years later in France. What made this invention so ahead of its time, other than the 300-year gap between da Vinci's sketch and the parachute's actual invention, is that it was solving a problem that didn't exist yet. There were no airplanes or helicopters. The first hot air balloon wouldn't even be invented until 300 years later, probably not so coincidentally the same year as the parachute. Even if da Vinci built his parachute successfully, what purpose would it even serve as there was no means of air travel? Humans have always dreamed of flying, but this wasn't an aircraft or a glider. It was a device with the sole purpose of allowing someone to fall straight down without injury. Theoretically, it could be used to quickly travel from the top of a cliff to the bottom, but presumably the jumper would need to return home, so they'd now have to carry the massive parachute all the way back up. Of course, da Vinci also drew designs for a helicopter, so perhaps he was solving a problem that he thought was going to soon exist. While this helicopter design was far too heavy and would not have worked, the same can't be said for his parachute. Despite skepticism from experts, which is a phrase you never want to hear when testing a parachute, daredevil Adrian Nicholas constructed da Vinci's parachute and tested it in the year 2000. Not only did it work, he claimed it was a smoother ride than traditional parachutes. While Leonardo da Vinci's work inspired this idea, French scientist René Descartes is the first one to create a pair of at least slightly functional contact lenses. Da Vinci had speculated that submerging a person's head in a bowl of water would alter their vision. This isn't exactly incorrect, but it's also not very helpful. Rather than focusing on creating a wearable fish tank for the vision impaired, da Vinci scaled down his idea to just a glass tube with a funnel to insert water, but this was still impractical and unwieldy. In 1636, inspired by da Vinci's ideas, Descartes took the idea one step further. He proposed a small glass lens filled with water placed in direct contact with the cornea. This direct contact makes them the first official contact lenses over 250 years before the invention of modern contact lenses. So did Descartes' lenses work? Well, sort of. The glass used wasn't designed to improve vision, so the only thing altering the wearer's vision was the water itself. They helped a little, but they also created a problem. The glass was too thick for the wearer of the lenses to blink. Despite Descartes' brilliant idea of lenses applied directly to the cornea to improve vision, the technology he needed just wasn't there yet. In order to efficiently cut and mold glass thin enough to make functional contact lenses, Descartes would have needed to wait until advances in the glass industry that didn't take place until the 1880s. Even then, while glass contact lenses were effective, they were too uncomfortable to gain widespread popularity. It wasn't until the invention of synthetic plastics that contact lenses became comfortable enough for people to actually wear. In 1936, exactly 300 years after Descartes shoved lenses so big the wearer couldn't blink into someone's eyes, the first plastic contact lenses were manufactured. Within a year, thousands of people would have adopted the technology to replace their glasses. Now, we'll get back to today's video in just a moment, but first, here's a quick word from today's sponsor, Backblaze. The best way to back up your files is with Backblaze. Look, as you guys know, I like to try the sponsors that we have on this show, and I have been using and trying Backblaze for years before they were even a sponsor. Right now, Backblaze is over there and pointing towards my computer, is sitting there just syncing all my files, backing them up to the cloud so I don't have to worry about it at all. Backblaze just takes care of it. Also, they have 
restored more than 55 billion files for their users, which is uh, well, it's an insane amount of protection. And how reliable are these guys? Well, they currently have almost two full exabytes of data stored and protected on their servers. Now, you're probably asking yourself, Simon, why is an exabyte? I've never heard of that. Well, that's because it's big. It's about two billion gigabytes. So yeah, Backblaze are the best, and they'll get your stuff to you anywhere in the world. You can download it, or they'll even mail you out a flash key with all of your files. And of course, it's all encrypted, so you don't have to worry about security. There's also unlimited, and there are no additional charges or fees, and it starts at just $7 a month for total digital peace of mind. Enjoy a fully featured 15-day no credit card required trial at backblaze.com slash side projects. Go there, try it out, protect yourself, and now back to today's episode. While the previous entries were ahead of their time by centuries with the rate of technological advances, it's important to remember the difference that just a few years can make. Such is the case with Audio Highway's portable digital music player, the Listen Up. The idea came from CEO Nathan Shuloff, who wanted the MP3 player to replace the popular Walkman and Discman portable devices. The device was first announced in 1996. It won the Innovation Award at the 1997 Consumer Electronics Show and the People's Choice Award at the 1998 Internet Showcase Conference. Now, if you haven't noticed yet, there was one obvious problem with the Listen Up. If you told someone in 1996 that you had a brand new portable MP3 player, they would have stared at you blankly and asked, well, but what is an MP3? While the MP3 coding format was created in December of 1991, no one actually knew what it was yet. Napster wasn't even created until 1999. Even for the OGs of music piracy, Scar Media Agent didn't exist until December of 1997. Shulhoff had just invented a device that everyone would want, they just didn't know it yet. So just how good was the world's first MP3 player, you ask? Well, we'll never really know. It's estimated that at most, only 25 units of the Listen Up were ever produced. In addition to MP3s not being familiar technology yet, there were a few other problems that held the product back from success, despite critical acclaim. The Listen Up could only hold 60 minutes of music. That's not great, but at the same time, it was about the length of a CD or a cassette anyway, so it shouldn't have been a deal breaker. The retail price was also $299. Again, not great, but while cheap portable CD players were only $100 in 1996, top of the line players were upwards of $250, so it's only a little bit of a stretch and it would avoid all the skipping. So far, things aren't looking incredible, but not enough to justify only 25 units ever being made. The key factors came from how music was put onto the MP3 player. Obviously, it would have to be connected to a computer, but the music was to be downloaded from the AudioWiz store created by Audio Highway to facilitate use of the player. It was essentially iTunes before iTunes. Now, that's incredibly forward thinking, but the store didn't have any music that people wanted. Oh, and your enjoyment of the tracklist that you curated would be interrupted with 30 second advertisements. The iPod would only launch five years later, and of course, it was a massive commercial success success as was the iTunes store. With the exception of using the device the consumer paid for to interrupt the music they also paid for with advertisements, it really seems like Schulhoff's ideas were almost entirely right. It's amazing what a few years difference makes. Had he only waited a few more years, larger hard drives would have been available to store more songs and he could have gotten more licensing deals for the audio with store and the Recording Industry Association of America would have shut down Napster. Instead, Schulhoff would have to console himself with the fact that he got to sell his company and patents to Sony. Not bad, though. Charles Babbage, a British mathematician, inventor, engineer, and philosopher, had a simple dream. He was sitting in his room at the Analytical Society, a club he and his friends had founded, checking over a table of logarithmic functions produced by the French government. He was annoyed by how riddled with mistakes the table was, and his dream was for the calculations to be done and printed by an infallible machine. Not at all a lofty goal for 1812. Babbage set to work on his design, and by 1821 it was ready for construction. The first computer, named the difference engine was going to require 25,000 individual parts and weigh approximately 8,000 pounds. Eleven years later, Babbage would receive one-seventh of the part of the machine that performed calculations. A year later, that would be all that remained of the world's first computer. In 1833, work ceased on the project over a disagreement regarding compensation and 12,000 of the computer components were melted down for scrap. The entire ordeal was funded by the British government, who were none too happy about the colossal failure. The uncompleted project had cost them as much as 20 
51 brand new steam locomotives. Considering the project was nowhere near completed at the time it ended, it does beg the question of just how many trains a computer would have been worth in the 1830s. With the difference engine project stalled out, Babbage set to work designing something new, something essentially incomprehensible. It was later named the analytical engine. While the differential engine was designed specifically to calculate polynomials, the analytical engine was to be a general purpose programmable computation machine, essentially a giant mechanical computer that could perform any complex function. Babbage spent years on this design, but he never attempted to build it. The engines were powered by a crank, and the difference engine would have been able to be cranked by hand, but the analytical engine would have been so large and heavy it could only be cranked by steam-powered machines. His newer engine may have been far too ambitious, but he learned a lot from it. From 1847 to 1849, Babbage set forth and designed a new machine, the cleverly named Difference Engine No. 2. This updated design utilized a lot of the techniques that it developed while designing the analytical engine. His design was pared down from an unwieldy 25,000 different parts to only 8,000. Despite being able to eliminate much of the complexity and over two-thirds of the moving parts, the new design was going to weigh approximately 10,000 pounds or 2,000 pounds greater than the more complex design. For unknown reasons, Babbage never attempted to build this final engine either. Babbage was 100 years ahead of his time, with the first programmable computer not being developed until 1938. So why did he fail? Babbage was independently wealthy, had high social standing, had the backing and funding of the British government, and had access to the best engineers available. With so much time and money invested, how could Babbage never have seen one of his engines built to completion? There are a myriad of small contributing factors, but ultimately the failure all comes down to a single reason. Charles Babbage was kind of a douchebag whose brilliance was only matched by his ability to alienate people with his douchebagginess. This is a shame too, because his design worked perfectly. In 2002, construction on Difference Engine No. 2 was completed by a private party who then lent it to the Computer History Museum. The 10,000 pound machine of brass, iron and steel can be programmed with a polynomial function and will calculate it with total accuracy to 31 places, then both print a copy of the answer on paper with ink so that the user can see the result, as well as imprinting the answer into plaster to be used as a printing plate for tables. It's a remarkable feat of mathematics and engineering, and it begs the question of what the world would have looked like had construction been completed 153 years prior when it was first designed. For as long as reality has existed, humans have sought a way to escape it. Be it plays, movies, music, or any other form of entertainment, escapism has been a central driving force in our motivation to seek out these activities. As a result, few things have been more appealing since the explosion of digital technology than the dream of leaving reality, even if momentarily, to enter an alternate virtual reality. Enter the Nintendo Virtual Boy. Except, not really. What the virtual reality users were actually being offered was a red, monochromatic nightmare. The wearable headpiece cost $180 a release, roughly the same price as a Super Nintendo system, but the experience fell far short, not only of what was advertised, but also of basic expectations of video games at the time. The price would have been a bargain for a better experience, but the system was riddled with problems. One of the first things people noticed in the demos was that moving your head didn't do anything while using the Virtual Boy, a wearable piece of technology that covers your vision and is billed as virtual reality, has a basic expectation that should you look around around, what you're seeing will change. All the users would see were poor quality graphics, similar to a Tiger handheld electronic game of the time. The gameplay experience offered was nothing different than a normal video game either. The user still had to use a game controller, meaning that the only change this offered from normal gaming was that the screen was taped to your face for no apparent benefit. Not only was there no apparent benefit, there was also very apparent detriment. Reviewers and consumers alike complained that the uncomfortable headset combined with the monochromatic display resulted in dizziness, nausea, and headaches. Several prominent scientists stated that there could be more serious long-term effects, and some industry professionals speculated that extended use could result in permanent brain damage. That is extraordinarily far-fetched and really just baseless speculation, but it's still not the sort of publicity that a company really wants. Flash forward to modern day and the Oculus Quest 2 has sold over 10 million units, and it's not even the only VR headset on the market. Nintendo has a long history of innovation and trying new things, while other companies stick to a formula, but unfortunately in this instance their ambition had far outpaced the available technology. To their credit, while it was a product ahead of its time, Nintendo has never tried to spin the Virtual Boy as anything other than what it really was, a complete and total failure. 
So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see that video I mentioned at the beginning about ancient innovations, please check it out. It's linked to over the screen now, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.